everybody. Welcome to Your Money Map, sponsored by the Alliance for Lifetime Income. I'm Jean Chatsky. I am your host. And one of the statistics, the often bandied about statistics that troubles me the most about retirement is the one that says that more than half of all adults in this country have never even figured out how much it's going to cost them to retire. And part of the reason for that, part of the reason that they've never tried to figure it out is because they don't know what they want to do. They don't know what their second act is going to entail. And as we talk about often on this program, it needs to be, or it, it's best if it is meaningful. It's best if it not only satisfies your needs to continue to earn money, and many people these days have that need, but also fills you up in other ways, gives you joy, brings you happiness, enables you to maintain connections. That is what we are going to be talking about today. Whether you are watching me on LinkedIn, whether you're watching on Facebook, please join our conversation. Um, we love your input. We love your questions. We are happy to tee them up and answer them. And today, I have a fantastic fantastic guest with me who is going to help me do that. Nancy Colomer is an author. She is a recognized expert on retirement and semi-retirement. She writes a monthly blog for nextavenue.com and forbes.com and is the author of a book called Second Act Careers, 50 Ways to Profit from Your Passions During Semi-Retirement. She's also a retirement coach. And a, a retirement coach is somewhat of a new thing. So we're going to dig into what retirement coaches are and how they might be able to help you. But first, let me just say hi to Nancy and welcome. Thanks so much, Jean. It's lovely to be here. It's really nice to have you here. Tell us all a little bit about you and, and tell, us, tell us about what retirement coaches are and what they do. Sure. So my background, you've already given a, a lovely introduction. And as you said, I do. I am a career coach by training. I have a master's in career development. And I really spent the first 15 years or so of my practice helping moms who wanted to work on a flexible basis. And then in, the, in 2008, when we had the last, uh, you know, bad, we went through that, that diff very difficult financial time, I started talking with people who were my contemporaries, people who at the time were in their 50s. And they said, you know, I think when I retire, whatever that means these days, I am probably going to either want or need to work in some capacity. And the more I spoke with them, the more I realized that so many of the strategies and solutions I had uh, developed in my work with moms were applicable to this next, to the, the boomer generation. So in terms of what a retirement coach does, what a retirement coach does is really help people figure out at this point in their lives, how they want to spend their time. And because it's not all about golf and grandkids <laughs> and gardening, um, you know, that sounds great in the commercials, but these days retirements are lasting 20, 30, or sometimes even uh, more more years than that. So it's really critical that people figure out what uh, they want to do and how they want to spend their time. Because it's as I often say, it's a lot of hours to fill. It's a lot of years to fund. I, I Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I think that's really true. Somebody should put it on a t-shirt. Um, when, when it comes to figuring out what you want to do, I mean, this is something I don't think this is only this is something that doesn't just apply to retirement. I, I hear um, members of, of younger generations struggling with the make it something that we are passionate about. Yeah, so 
Uh, you're absolutely right. You know, I think as human beings, we are wired to look for meaning in what we do. We want what we do to somehow make a difference to people. Um, and that's true whether you are 18 or whether you are 68 and, and getting ready for retirement. And the, the process of figuring that out, and I emphasize that it is a process. It's not, you know, as much as I love those quizzes in magazines, you know, answer these 20 questions and here's your life purpose. Um, if, if it were only that simple, um, it's not that simple. It's a process of really thinking about a couple of things. First, what is it that you really enjoy doing? What is it that you do well? And what do you find most meaningful? And really thinking hard about those three questions. And the good news is once you're in your 50s or 60s, you have a lot of data and a lot of experience that you can look back on to help you answer those key questions. So that's the first step. And then you begin to take a look and explore and see what are some possible outlets for your talents and your interests. And then um, the third step, and in some sense, it's the most critical step, is then you, you need to get out there and really begin to try things out in small ways to see if what you think sounds like a good idea really measures up to it in reality. So it's, it's a three-step process. It does take time. But I always say to people, you know what, there's no more worthwhile project than yourself. Um, I think that's I think that's very very true. Um, I know we are seeing people come online and and join us. Um, hi to everybody who's watching, Andre and and Jim. Um, if you all have questions for Nancy, please go ahead and type them in the chat. I'll weave them into the conversation. The three steps you went through very quickly, and I'd like to unpack each of them a little bit. Um, when we talk about this process of self-reflection and introspection, what are the best ways to really get in touch with those things that will satisfy you both from a, um, a sort of a psychic perspective but also from a financial perspective. Yeah. So let me start off by saying that um, I mentioned, you know, really thinking hard about what it is that you love to do, do well and find meaningful. And that's the first piece of it. But the second piece of it, um, which is critical if you're looking to make money in this next chapter, is you need to match that to needs and opportunities and gaps in the marketplace. Because you know, we've all heard that saying about, you know, people being a starving artist. Well, there are plenty of artists who figure out a way to use their talents and, and monetize them. There are also a lot of people who are just doing art for art's sake. And if, if you're one of the people who wants to do that, that's great. But if you need to earn an income, you really need to think about what does the marketplace need and how can I serve people in, in that uh, niche that I'm, I'm looking to go after. So, the process of figuring that out, and again, it is even that first step is is a process, um, is about really thinking hard about some of the questions. As I mentioned before, the good thing is you have a lot of data to use. And so a really simple thing that people can do, Jean, is um, take out three sheets of paper and on one sheet, write, you know, things that I've loved doing. The next one, things that I do well. And on the third sheet, write what I find most meaningful. And then keep a running list and keep that going for about two weeks. And it can be things as simple as, I love planning trips, or I love going to the farmer's market to pick out um, fresh fruits and vegetables. And in terms of things that you do well, again, it can be obvious things. You know, I was great at facilitating meetings at my last job. Mm -hmm. And it may also be things that you've done in your personal life or your volunteer life. I am always the go-to person for relationship advice. And the, the point of this exercise is really to keep the three lists and then look for what are the common threads and the themes that run across those three columns. And I think if, if you do this over a period of time, you will begin to see themes. And what's great is once you see the themes, you can then begin to uh, explore ways to, to use those skills and interests in, in ways that would be more flexible and more lifestyle friendly. And, and potentially more profitable. In your book, you have a story about a woman who decided to explore being an extra um, on, 
on um, movie sets. Can can you talk about her evolution? Because I think I think the fact that it was such an evolution is um, really instructive in how this is a process. Yeah. So um, I love her. I love her story. Her name was Eve Young. And she is someone she had been at the point that I interviewed her. She really, for most of her adult life, she had been a power volunteer. We all have those in our communities. Um, she had done lots of things, and but she had not done a whole lot of work for pay. Um, and in 2008, her husband's business was not doing well. She needed to go out and earn some money. And when she really thought about things that she loved doing, one of the things that she had always enjoyed in her volunteer life was actually presenting in front of groups. So she liked the idea of being on stage. And someone is really like a lark said to her, you know, if you ever consider being an acting extra, it was something she had not thought about it at all. And acting extras are people who you see in a movie or TV show who, you know, sort of blend into the background. Um, so as luck would have it, she just kept her eyes on the classifieds and she saw a tiny little ad to be an extra on the TV show, Ugly Betty. And she went and she did that and she just loved it. She loved being in that atmosphere. She loved being in a really creative atmosphere. And what's so interesting about her story is she's someone, she comes from a multicultural background. Um, and so she's part uh, Native American Indian, part African American, older woman, she had gray hair. And the casting director came up to her and said, you know, you have a great look mm -hmm. and right now, we have a really hard time finding older people who have a multicultural look. We have lots of 30-somethings uh, who are blonde. We don't have very many people who look like you. And she started getting more and more work. The more time she spent on that, she, start, she really enjoyed it. She started getting work in print ads. And then she started taking acting classes and then eventually ended up as a recurring bit role on a TV show. So it's a great story because, as you said, it really illustrates how this takes place step by step by step if you're intentional about the process. When you're going through your original search, when you're coming out of college or coming out of graduate school and deciding that you're going to go in search of a particular career, you're doing it with a group of your peers, typically when you're doing it at this later stage in life it, as you're thinking about retirement as you're entering retirement you don't have um you don't typically have a posse right you don't typically have that that group of like-minded people going through the same thing at the same time is that why having a coach or hiring a coach can be helpful Definitely. And I think it's a really important point that when we go through many of our other major life transitions, we do have a team of people in place to help us and support us and guide us. This is a, for a lot of people, it's a very isolating process. And so not only do you suddenly lose the community that you had at work, um, but you're trying to move into a new world without having anyone who you can talk things over with. And so it can be uh, very difficult for people to do this on their own. And, and that is how a coach can can make a big difference for people. Um, but it doesn't, I always say, you know, it doesn't have to be a retirement coach. If you can find one or two other people going through it at the same time, um, you know, form a support group, uh, find somebody who you can take regular walks with to talk about your progress. There are, you know, we all, we often hear that quote about there's 10 million boomers retiring every day. A lot of people are going through this at the same time. And so it's incredibly helpful to have that support and camaraderie and, and cheerleading. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. I'm talking with Nancy Colomer. We're talking, if you're just joining us, about second act careers in retirement, finding something that you want to do that's purposeful, that's meaningful, and yeah, that maybe provides some sense of an income um, for as long as you need it to do that. If you've got questions for Nancy, if you've got questions for me, please go ahead and, and put them in the chat. Um, happy Happy to weave you into the conversation no matter where you are joining us from. The third part of your process is really trying things out and experimenting. Um, 
how much experimenting should you do? I mean, if you've got on your list, well, I think I, I really like uh, walking my dog. I really like going to the theater and I really like reading, right? I mean, you're, you've got interests that are all over the map. How do you take those and then start to actively experiment to figure out where you fit and how much time do you give this process? Yeah, so it's a great question. And so I'm going to start with the last question first, which is how much time do you give this process? Um, you know, what I often say to people is that it can take a solid two years after you retire to really find your rhythm and find your new routine. And people um, are very surprised to hear that, but it, it does it does take people time. And so one of the things I often encourage people to do is to think of the first year out as a gap year. Use that year to really um, try some things out. And, and again, we're talking about doing things in small doses. So how do you go about doing that? Well, you can you can take a course. And I'm, I'm a big fan of taking courses because what taking a course does is it gives you a you know, once you sign up for the course, you have it on your calendar. So it becomes a commitment. Um, and and if you can do it when you're get, getting out of the house, I mean, I think online courses are fine, but I think all things being equal, if you can get out among other people, it's really invigorating. So think about taking a course, you could join a, a club or start a club. You know, maybe you're somebody who's, who's thinking, I'd like to read more. Think about joining a book club. It's it's a you know fun thing that you can do, and you can test it out. And these are all things you can do while you are still working. And the other thing I often encourage people to do is um, commit to one challenge. And by that I mean uh, think of something, some area that you'd like to address. You know, for I hear from a lot of people when they leave work, they say, you know, it's time for me to really concentrate on on. Um, adapting healthier habits. Mm. So I want to walk more, or I want to learn how to cook in a healthier way. Um, and so, you know, whether it's, okay, I'm going to commit to walking three miles a day, or I'm going to commit to, um, you know, there's all different types of challenges that, that you can embrace. I saw something fun the other day on TV where they were talking about in Vermont, there is a club of people who I think it's 251 towns. Um, in, I saw it too. Yeah, yeah, uh, in Vermont and people who who do that. You know, right now is World Series season. Um, there are people who decide their personal challenges. They're going to arrange to hit every ballpark with their their grandchild. Um, there's all sorts of things that you can come up with, and I think there's no reason why you can't do all three of those things at at once, but. It depends on what else you have going on in your life. And so if you find that overwhelming, pick one and, and stick with that and see how it goes. One of our viewers on LinkedIn says that they feel the semi-retirement process is over two to five years while they explore the new interests and, and hobbies, that 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 time frame is working well for them and they're slowly replacing the work environment and in evolving into the next phase, two to five years rather than just a, a straight two. But it sounds like it syncs up very nicely with, with yours. And um, and Kathy writes that she's recently widowed. I'm, I'm sorry about that, Kathy. Um, sorry for your loss. She's retired and she moved from South Carolina back to New Jersey, which puts you right in our neck of the woods. Um, she's very social. Any ideas? Yeah. So, um, you know, Kathy, I think you raise a really important point, which is one of the biggest challenges for people in retirement is forming new social connections. Because for most people, as adults, we get our social connections either through work, or if you have children, through the parents of our children's friends. Um, and when both of those disappear, and particularly if you relocate to a new area, it can be really challenging to form new social connections. So you're raising a really important point. Um, and, you know, I, I just went through this personally. I know Jean just went through this personally. Moving to a new area is hard. It's hard to meet people. So a couple of suggestions, again, getting back to the idea of 
taking a course or joining a club. Um, I recently moved to our, our home here in Pennsylvania. And so I looked up, okay, where can I take some courses? I've been doing that and it's been a nice way to, to meet people. Um, here locally, there's been a book club. I got involved with that. So you have to push yourself a bit and it can be, it can be uncomfortable, but all I can tell you is there are so many other people going through that at the same time who, and they would love to meet some new people as well. So um, it's a bit like being in junior high all over again. Yeah. Yeah. Kathy, I can tell you when my, when my mother went through this, cause we lost my father fairly young, she took a lot of art classes and, and met a nice circle of people that way. Um, and she actually started working part-time. Um, which got her out and about, even though she hadn't been working before. She was a, a longtime teacher, so she had those sorts of skills, and she started uh, teaching continuing ed classes um, through human resource departments at different places, and and that that was helpful too. It just got her got her engaged. Um, Jason writes, my friend, my family sold our business and I'm exploring the idea of starting another business, taking my experiences and focusing on the parts of the business I love the most. I'm thinking about starting a business consulting on DEI or a business focused on family business consulting. How do I decide what to pursue and how do I decide what additional experience or education I need. Jason, just my focus group of one, a little, a little me search. I think people need, you're, you're in the right ballpark. Um, DEI is such a hot area and family businesses need help, particularly from people who have exited them successfully. So I think, I think you're onto something there, but Nancy, what would you say? Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, obviously, you know, diversity and inclusion is a really a hot topic these days. And there's a lot going on with that. So <clears throat> that would be my first suggestion is take a look at what other service providers in that niche are doing to see what are the types of services and products that they're offering, because that can give you a good sense of what I enjoy doing the same thing. Is it consulting to corporations? Is it speaking at universities? Um, take a look at what they're actually doing. If you can try to get a feel for what they're, what they're charging, um, because that's part of the equation as well. The same thing with people who are helping family businesses. And so I think it's, um, you know, one of the great things about living in the internet age is that you can reach out to somebody who's doing, let's say DEI consulting in a different part of the country and have a conversation with them. They're not going to be as worried that you're going to uh, impinge upon their business. And people are very flattered when people reach out and, and oftentimes are surprisingly willing to give some advice. Another one of my favorite resources is SCORE, um, which is sponsored by the U.S. Small Business Administration. And I know of several entrepreneurs who have had really um, impactful conversations with their mentors at SCORE. And SCORE provides free mentoring. They have webinars for people that are starting their own businesses. The good news about being an entrepreneur in 2022 is that there are a lot of uh, free and really high quality counseling and uh, support services out there to assist you. Yeah, and and uh, one of our LinkedIn users also suggested score for you, Jason, formerly called the Service Corps of Retired Executives. And this guy says a, a friend of his worked a lot with them, or this person says a friend of his worked a lot, a friend of theirs worked a lot with them after he sold his business um, that he had created in his, in his fifties. So, um, kudos to, to score for, for being out there. Nancy, let's talk a little bit about the financial piece. Um, as you are transitioning to retirement, there's the, what am I going to do? How am I going to fill my hours piece of it? And then a, a whole lot of questions about how you're going to afford it. Do you work with financial advisors? Um, I, I mean, where where do financial advisors fit into this picture? Yeah, so it's a great question because obviously your financial status and your financial flexibility really impacts the type of second act choices that you make. 
So um, ideally, you would have already been working with a financial planner so that you have a good sense of uh, what your your budget in retirement is going to look like. And while I don't get into the numbers with people, one of the things we always talk about, though, is what are what is your financial stability? Um, what is the financial feasibility of pursuing some of these options? And sometimes people really don't know. And so what I always say to people is, you know, before we go any further, it's really important that you get a handle on these numbers because your choices will be impacted by by those numbers. And so um, you need to gain, gain clarity around that. So every case is different, um, but at a minimum, people need to do some number crunching on their own. And if they can work with a financial advisor to help them gain clarity, I think that's really useful. Um, ideally, in a perfect world, you know, we, we'd be partnered up and we'd be doing this together as a team. But oftentimes that doesn't happen. I think it, it raises the question, is retirement coaching just about work? Not at all. No, it's um, and I will tell you that most of the people who contact me for retirement coaching, they um, oftentimes are fairly high level executives and professionals. And so money is not their primary driver. What they are looking for is to find meaningful activities and they are dealing with questions of, you know, the whole question of who am I when I am no longer the doctor or the lawyer? is very relevant to a lot yeah. of people. Um, and so people are looking to find relevance and meaning and, uh, you know, as well as fun and relaxation in, in these retirement years. So it's about finding the right mix of activities and really thinking about a portfolio of activities that involve learning and growth and uh, oftentimes some aspect of volunteering or giving back. Um, as well as possibly some income generating activities and then things that you do also in the area of health and wellness. That is always important, but it becomes even more important as we age. I, I worry about both the loss of identity, right? If I'm no longer a financial reporter, financial journalist, what am I? Who am I? Right. I, I think about that. And, mm -hmm. and that's kind of hard to acknowledge, but I do. Um, but I also worry about if I retired, what would I do all day? Mm -hmm. Do you find that that's a problem for people? Just just filling up the hours. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it is a much bigger problem than most people realize it. You know, again, we we are sold this vision of oh, it's going to be so wonderful and you can spend your time, you know, playing golf and sitting on the beach all day. Well, you know, that's really appealing when you have other things going on in your life. But if that's all you have going on in your life, um, so, uh, over time, it, it wears thin. And so it gets back to finding that mix of activities that that bring you purpose and meaning. Um, and it, it can be challenging. And then people also deal with, you know, real life issues. You have a spouse that suddenly needs caretaking or you have elderly parents um, or you, you yourself are dealing with health issues. So there are a lot of things that have to be taken into account. And that's why I always say to people, you know, it's, it's great to plan ahead. I'm clearly in favor of, of developing a vision and a plan, but you also need to be aware that um, you will need to amend that plan as time goes on. And so the idea is to come up with, with something that really fits, but is not rigid so that you can adapt it to your cir circumstances as they evolve. Janet points out that with more and more remote positions, she thinks there will be more opportunities for people as we age and as we semi-retire because this can provide greater flexibility in our later years. How has remote work since the pandemic changed retirement as you see it and changed the way you're directing your clients? Yeah, such an important point. Um, and I think that this is one of the key trends that is impacting the whole idea of second act careers. And I love this question because I have just oodles of examples of service providers who adapted their businesses during the pandemic to have them be virtual where 
pre-pandemic, they always delivered their services in person. So I'll just share very quickly two, two examples. One is, and this is really an interesting one, um, a woman who's a lactation consultant. And so she helps, you know, new moms who are experiencing difficulties with breastfeeding. She had always delivered her services in, in person. And when the pandemic hit, she thought, oh man, you know, I, I'm not going to have any business. The exact opposite happened hmm. because she was able, she quickly discovered that people were okay with doing this on Zoom. These mothers were really eager to get some help. So they were willing to do it on Zoom. And because she no longer needed to drive to get to her clients and then drive back home again, she was able to see many more clients in the course of a day. On top of that, insurance started to pay for telehealth, um, whereas before they didn't. So her business actually doubled during the pandemic. I have another friend who works as a social worker um, and really, you know, was not acceptable to meet with people by Zoom prior to the pandemic. Now all sorts of mental health services, therapy, uh, coaching is all being delivered uh, online. And, you know, I know in my own practice, when I used to say to people, would you like to come to my office or, or can we do it by Zoom? And, you know, the idea of doing it by Zoom was just like, no way. Now, everybody just, you know, that that's the way I work with people by Zoom. And as a result, I can work with people around the, the country. I even hired a paint consultant when we moved who, you know, I walked around, I walked around my house. I'm terrible with picking out paint colors. And I walked around the house with my iPhone and she took notes and then she sent me paint samples and I paid her on a per room basis. I so, think, yeah, I think the things that we can do, I learned how to color my hair on Zoom. So I think the list of things that we can do um, on Zoom, that we can learn on Zoom, that we can get on Zoom are are, are, are endless. Um, hi to Marcia and Amazonia. Doesn't matter that you're late to the party. We're happy that you join us. And I hope that you'll take the time to um, to go back and watch parts of this conversation that you missed because Nancy's been doling out lots of really, really helpful advice about retirement and your second act, not just paying for it, but finding something to do that is that is meaningful and, and that fills you up in a whole host of ways. For those people watching for whom, like me, this whole idea of a retirement coach is a fairly new thing, how do we find one? So the best way to find one, obviously, is, is a referral. Ask people who you know, uh, who may have worked with somebody in the past. Um, but uh, that aside, I think if you just uh, start reading articles on retirement, you will see certain names quoted again and again. That's a great way. Um, you can always Google it. And then there are some retirement associations that do maintain directories of retirement coaches. Um, what I will say is in selecting a retirement coach, you do want to interview people because there are some people who, who become retirement coaches from a financial planning background, and that might be extremely helpful for you. Other people like myself come at it from a career counseling background. Um, still other people are just intrigued by the subject and they go through the training and they become coaches. So it is one of those professions that unfortunately is not very highly regulated at all. And so you do need to spend the time to really find somebody who fits your needs. When we interview them, what should we ask them? We we did our last show was with Pam Kruger, who um, well runs a company that helps people find financial advisors. And she said, you got to ask everyone, are you a fiduciary? Mm -hmm. What what are the top three questions that we should be asking a retirement coach to see if they are qualified and a good fit? Yeah. So the first thing I would ask about. So there are no, as I said, there are no specific um, regulations around being a retirement coach. So unfortunately, you know, you can't ask something like, you know, are you a fiduciary? What you can ask though is the first thing I would ask is about their education and training, because there are some training programs out there uh, to, for people that are interested in becoming retirement coaches. So I would ask about the, the training. Um, I would also ask them to tell, tell you about their last three clients. Um, you know, just, and, you know, 
obviously I don't share all, any personal information about clients, but just in general, can you describe the profile of who you tend to work with? Because different people tend to work with different different types of people. As I said, I tend to work with higher level professionals and executives. That's sort of my sweet spot. That's not the case with everyone. So I would ask them. Um, and then third, I would ask about their process. Um, what is the process that you use with people? Some people require that you sign on for six months. Other people have a much more uh, a la carte type process. So it's not that one is necessarily better or worse than the other, just depends on what's going to be the right fit for you. Um, and if they would like more information about you or about your particular practice, where do we go to get that? Sure. They can go to my website, which is mylifestylecareer.com. And also, uh, as you mentioned in the intro, I do um, a monthly column for nextavenue.org. Um, so if you just go there and look under work, work and purpose, you can see a variety of articles that I've written about retirement and work and finding your life's purpose. So I think there's a lot there that, that might be of interest to folks. Well, this was very interesting to me as, as I think about these things in my own life, and I'm sure for many people here as well. Nancy Collimer, thank you so much for doing this. For everybody watching, if you'd like additional information on any of the topics that we talk about on this show, you can go to protectedincome.org. That's our website. And if you're looking specifically for information on this show, protectedincome.org slash Collimer. Nancy, thank you so, so much. Thanks. It was great to have this discussion. Absolutely. Have a great week, everybody. Bye. Bye.